Whoa. As promised, part three. Yes, this is my version of, I just want to spend a day with you. Um, and we did that on the first two videos, and we sp it, that was an all-day event. Uh, so I've got probably another all-day event coming at you now. We're going to run this 26-gallon still. Well, I've been excited, to say the least, uh, to kind of get started again today. So after a full night of just kind of sitting back and going through in my head what's going to happen, I uh, thought we'd turn the camera on and get back in action. Now, we spent an all whole day yesterday in the preparation, the setup, uh, the cleaning, uh, and we discussed a lot of topics. So if you missed anything, because there wasn't any rhyme or reason, it was sort of just like me spending the day with you um, and just sharing some arbitrary thoughts. Uh, go back and watch these two videos. Uh, they're, I, I think they're full of a lot of tidbits of information that... Uh, you know, I probably have covered before, but uh, this time we just kind of made it a point. Um, look, I've got this thing running, and uh, I actually don't have the still running. You can hear the pump in the background. See, that's that, that booster pump, because uh, I've got that, and, and I've turned the water on already. And, and now the reason I did that, because of my laziness, all right? About 75 feet away from the shop is the pool, and I kind of envisioned since it's a blistery 68 degrees in the bottom of that pool that I would pump that water out of the pool via a hose all the way into here and then run it into that booster pump. Uh, now that pump that's in the pool did work and did run water through this entire system but I wasn't real confident that I was going to have the head pressure necessary to run both the deflagmator and the condenser at the same time. So I had the booster pump on hand, and I figured it's better to have and not need, you know, than to need and not have. Uh, it's terrible to get into the middle of a run and go, oops. So uh, I put the booster pump, and now I run that, and the water's been running. And I left it on because I don't want to get up and go all the way over there and unplug that and then turn that. I could, but I've got like 18,000 gallons, and there's no way. You know what I mean? Okay. So, uh, yeah, I left this thing full all night long. Kind of begs a question is, uh, and I get this a lot, is uh, let me ask you the question. Well, how long will a mash last once it's finished fermenting? Uh, you've degassed it and clarified it. How long will it last? Uh, you know, before it, you know, the, ooh, it's going to turn to vinegar. Um, how long will it last? Well, believe it or not, it'll, it, alcohol is a natural preservative. Um, and unless you introduce... Uh, the acetobacter um, organism, yeah, because I've been corrected before by calling it a virus or a bacteria, uh, the organism, uh, unless you introduce that, uh, it, you cannot wind up with vinegar. So how long will it last? Yeah, it's uh, indefinitely, really, uh, because alcohol is a natural preservative, and it'll just sit there and wait on you. Uh, I have had a, a sugar wash that I had set for over a year before I got to it. Um, you know, that may not work for everybody, but it worked in that particular instance. So um, there's no need to rush to it, okay? I get that all the time. You know, it's always oh, finished fermenting. I've got to get to it within three days or it's going to turn to vinegar. Well, for those who have ever made vinegar, you know that that process takes several months. So there's no way it can turn into vinegar in about three days. Um, I've got everything hooked up. No, this, I say I love this. This is this is where I get all excited and, and, and oh, yeah, yeah. Please just forgive me as my as my excitement just blares through here. Um, I've got my two pulse with modulators up there because I've got two 5,500 watt elements in there. I already know that I don't need two 5,500 watt elements. I just happen to have them in there and I'm able to control them. So. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to turn it on, and once I turn, let me do that first. Let me just turn. Here's my master for one of them, and I've got that turned on, and here's the master for the second one. Now, um, how many amps sh should I be putting? See, I'm on two 50-amp circuits, so I've already split more than safe. How many amps should I be pulling through there if uh, I'm running a full power 5,500-watt element? Well, you remember from yesterday, if you do the math, it's pretty simple. Here, here's my calculator. Uh, 5,500 divided by 
240 volts <coughs> equals, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> 22.9 or 23 amps. So a 5,500 watt element operating at 100% is going to pull about 23 amps. And that way you know it's, well, that, it, that's the way it works. Uh, but what if it was a 3,500 watt element? Well, if it was a 3,500 watt element, 3,500 divided by 240 equals 14.5 amps. So, not in theory, in actuality. What if I just turn these up to, so I'm going to run this one at 14.5 amps. Oh, 17, 18, back up, George, back off. There we go. See, I can hear it. You can hear it running. Uh, okay, there we go. 14, okay, 13.8, 14.6. Okay, so I'm 14.6, 14.0. Oh, yeah, 14 point, yeah, about 14.6 in both of them. So what do I have now? Oh, think through it. I've got two 3,500-watt elements operating, okay? See how that works? Uh, so instead of having two 5,500-watt elements and having an astronomical amount of energy going in there, uh, I want to heat this up relatively slow. I don't want to go too fast, but uh, then again, I don't want to go so slow that it takes me all day to do this. So I theorize, I'm just, I'm just quick calculations. I've only got 20 gallons, 21 gallons. So uh, two 3,500 watt elements, which would be a total of seven kilowatts or 7,000 watts. Um, it shouldn't take too long. Uh, so we'll give you a time hack uh, whenever we get this thing heated up. And I'm gonna be tracking two temperatures. One I'll track in the kettle just to give me an, an idea, an indicator of where it's at. I could actually do without this completely. Uh, but then I'm going to be tracking the temperature at the head, and that is right above the deflagmator. Now, recall there's two ways to actually run. Um, actually, there's three ways, okay? There's two ways that I'll describe, and then there's what we call the other way. Uh, all right? Um, okay, one way to run a reflux still is to run it as an open pot still first and then draw off your four shots in your heads and then introduce the reflux. Uh, but that takes a little bit of balancing, it takes a little bit of art and skill and once you get really, really comfortable with your system, it's really, really easy to do. Uh, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, the other way of starting a reflux still is to start the deflagmator at 100%. So everything that rises up through the column condenses and drops back down and starts loading your plates. Uh, and then once all your plates are loaded and you start to get the separation activity, then you turn your reflux down to control that and then start your collection. So there's, you see, there's really two ways. It, one, you can go at it direct or you can kind of go at it backwards in, if you want to think of it that way. And then, of course, there's the other way. And we don't have to discuss the other way because that way doesn't work. No, figure it out. Uh, sorry. Uh, all I can do is be honest. Uh, you can figure it out. Oh, we'll be back shortly because I'm going to let this thing heat up. This should take me, oh, I don't know. Let's guess. Uh, 7, 000, 7 kilowatts, uh, 21 gallons. I'm thinking probably 40 minutes. We'll find out when we get back. It has been 17 minutes, and we are now, I have uh, right shy of 150 degrees or uh, 62 degrees Celsius, somewhere in that neighborhood, uh, in the kettle itself. So, and I can already see that my bottom sight glass is starting to fog up, so that means I'm developing a little bit of vapor uh, as this thing starts to heat up. Um, this is going to be amazing. So we're about halfway into it, I guess. Um, we're going to see how long this takes to bring it up to temperature. Um, it should not take that long. Now, um, please, if you get an opportunity, I, see, I didn't get to it yet, did I? Yeah, subscribe, share us with your friends, and comment below. I've been spending a lot of time reading comments. I, I, I read comments every day, uh, but unfortunately, I don't get a chance to answer each and every one of them. I mean, that would be almost ludicrous on my part. Uh, because of the hundreds. 
but the comments are just amazing and then the back and forth in between different people that are on the channel uh, is just priceless so please keep that up yes all right um i've got a couple of other things out here i've got my mason jars and i i, I like to collect in these large wide mouth half gallon uh mason jars and uh, and the reason i do that is because i normally will kind of combine everything at the end anyway um Look, it, it's different strokes for different folks. I mean, some people like to collect them in small pints all the way through, and that's quite all right. I mean, that's a little bit different of a, that's a technique. Uh, it's not a violation of any process. That's a technique in uh, how someone else wants to do their collection. I have, and sometimes I will, use small pint jars at the very end if I'm trying to be very, very precise at a cut, uh, or I'll use quart jars. But in this particular case, because I have so much, I'm going to use half gallons um, just because I know I'm going to draw an awful lot. Now, I'm also using a reflux, so I should get a really high proof. And uh, that should run from beginning to end until I shut it off. Uh, again, it's totally up to you on when and where you shut it off, but uh, I sort of have my own data points uh, that I'll look at, and uh, we'll get to that when the time comes. Yes. Oh, see, see how we just kind of tease you into watching the rest of it? Hopefully you do. Uh, all too often, I, I'll, I'll cover something in a video, and on that video, someone will comment and ask a question about something I just covered. I understand. Yeah, you you kind of go fast forward through it because you don't want to watch. I got it. I got it. Okay, I've got my two hydrometers out here, and yeah, I know I beat this to death. Which one should I use? We're not fermenting now. We're distilling. So when you're distilling, you use the which one? I'm not hearing it. Yeah, there it is. Yeah, the proof and trail hydrometer, not the standard beer and wine hydrometer. Because remember, the scales go like this. This one only measures to here, and then this one, the proof and trail hydrometer, picks up where this one leaves off. So if I drop this one in, it would just disappear. This is the one that we want to use. It's lighter, and it will measure the viscosity, which is kind of like it. You know, alcohol is lighter than water, so it measures really the viscosity about how this floats uh, to give you a measurement of ethanol. So you, you got to use this one. And again, uh, make sure I, I can put this down because I own several, and as soon as I put it down, it's not going to go anywhere. Uh, for some reason, it just knows that. Uh, if I only had one, of course, as soon as I put it down, it would roll off and bust. Uh, we just carefully insert that there. I'm all set now, and I've got the water running still. Uh, my head temperature is still with the ambient temperature in the shop, which is a blistering 81. Um, and 81 is going to run you somewhere around two, 27 or so Celsius. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, and I can start to see I'm getting some fog activity in my sight glasses but it'll be a while because we are now approaching 160 degrees in the kettle we'll be back you know it's one of those things you just can't help it you know once once you, <laughs> um i've got a flashlight of course and i'm looking inside the sight glasses you know this one's starting to get nice and wet and this one's fogging up this one's starting to fog um it's just one of those things it's just you know uh, I don't know, I likened it to, you know, standing around, a whole bunch of guys standing around a fire barrel. There, there may not even be a fire, but for some reason you're just attracted to the barrel itself. Uh, and the same thing happens when uh, you start running one of these. You just can't help but watch what's going on. Uh, it really makes a big difference if you think, or if you do, uh, fully understand what's happening at the, at, during this process. Now, we did a video that we are, oh uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're closely approaching 170 degrees in the kettle itself. Um, um, we did a video uh, some time ago about separation of methanol. Uh, look, I don't want to get all into that because it's a long video about methanol itself and the methanol scare across America when it comes to distilling. Um, trust me, no, I don't want to say it that way. Look, bottom line, uh, you are not going to separate or create, first of all, and separate enough methanol to hurt anybody unless you separate it in a pure form and ingest that and only that. Uh, again, stop and think about this. You know, when, when, it, when we make beer, wine, or whiskey, we do the first step is all the same. It's 
fermentation. Uh, but when we finish fermenting beer and then we clarify it and then we put it in bottles, uh, we do the same thing. We get wine, we clarify it, we put it in bottles, but when it comes to whiskey, for some reason, uh, we separate the methanol because that's the bad stuff. Uh, well, we separate it because there's that one added step. We, we can. We're in the dis distillation process and we know when, when it comes off. So we can kind of separate that. But in beer and wine, we don't worry about it. It's not even an issue of concern. Uh, you see, you're making the same amount. It's just you spread it out equally over all of those bottles um, and it's minuscule so it's not, you know, it, the solution for methanol poisoning is an overdose of ethanol because uh, ethanol competes with the methanol. That's the way that if you had methanol poisoning they would just give you a bunch of ethanol. Uh, what a way to recover, huh? Yeah, so but so if you got all that ethanol spread out and you've got a little bit of methanol, you see the ethanol, the methanol is competing with the methanol the whole time and it's, there's not enough there to really hurt you. So my point being is that when we're going, we're going to collect, and I always use an average. Uh, th this is sort of like a rule of thumb. You know, the, uh, the first two ounces of every five gallons is what I call the four shots. And that, are, that, that is your higher level alcohols, your acetones, your methanols. A methanol comes off at 145. Uh, ethanol doesn't start to uh, evaporate or vaporize until about 173-ish. Uh, so you've got that big wide gap. Uh, so if you could take off your methanol at the very beginning because that's going to happen at 145. Uh, but see, we've got all these plates and a lot of activity going on here. So what'll ha what will happen? Well, invariably, it will start to rise, condense, drop, rise, condense, drop. We know that. That's okay. But it still will be the first thing that comes off. Now, I, I've read this, and this is absolutely true. There is methanol from the very beginning to the very end of your run. We don't normally talk about it because it's, it's in such small quantities uh, that it's almost imperceptible. Uh, the majority of your methanol and your unwanted alcohols, your your higher level alcohols uh, come off at the very beginning. So if you pull those off, it, what, what you have left is not worth even discussing. Uh, so that's what we'll do. So I've got this 21 gallon, so I'll pull off what, two, four, six, eight, about eight ounces will be what I would consider my four shots. Um, now my other rule of thumb for heads is twice the amount of four shots. So another 16 ounces or so will be right at the point where I've got my heads pulled off. But see, in this particular case, you know, heads is a moving target depending on your mash. So just pay close attention to it. The easiest way, the easiest way to tell when you've gone from heads to hearts is when you see an initial drop in your proof. If you drop three percent, of, yeah, three proof points drastically, that's a drastic drop in a very, very short period of time, a few minutes, well then you've gone from one set to the next set, which is from the heads to your hearts. Now, heads are full of flavor, um, and uh, people love heads, and some people even use the heads to go back and reintroduce those into the final product in order to get a balance and a flavor profile they're looking for. So, totally up to you. Um, we are rocking and rolling. I'm still at 80 degrees head temperature, and we are now at 180 degrees in the kettle. What more can I offer you? Now, what? We are right now at about 42 minutes, and 42 minutes now, my bottom bubble plate is starting to fill. Two things are happening, though. I've got a little bit of foam. You'll see that start to pop up, but... Uh, it's also filling up because you'll notice that this top one is starting to fog up so that means that all the vapor that's up here is dropping back down and it's filling this bottom plate. Now I'm going to allow that to foam for just a few minutes and that should settle itself back out. I can actually see the second plate starting to fill and we'll let these fill all the way up. 
Okay, now, you, now you'll notice that this is great. This is great. Uh, these have started, they've settled down, and this bubble plate's loaded, that's loaded, this one's loaded, and some activity. This one is loaded with activity, and this one's loaded. So I've got a lot of activity. My head temperature is right over 160, which is a little over 72 degrees Celsius. And I'm right at, oh, about 190 degrees in my kettle. So I should be running now um, a full reflux because nothing is escaping so far. Now I got to make sure that I turn these down to about, what if I turn them down to 8 amps each, that means I'm only running 4,000 watts. So I wanted to give you a close-up of this just so you can see. This is a, uh, there we go. There's your bottom bubble plate. There's the second one. There's my third bubble plate. You can see the activity in that. And there is the top bubble plate. Now if I continue on up, you can see there's my head temperature. And if I work my way back down, it's top. There's the second, third, the fourth and the fifth bubble plate and now I'm waiting patiently for my opportunity to turn down the reflux because what I'm doing now is I'm loading this column well now for the sake of explanation okay you'll notice when we did a close-up you'll notice that my side glasses were a little bit dirty on the inside uh, and that's because I had a lot of foam that since I've got such a high level of high volume in here and it's just a side effect it, it happens uh, and that's quite all right uh, but it foamed up and it foamed up through these sight glasses and it actually pushed itself all the way up but remember I, or I mentioned a lot, I, way way back you know about checking and making sure there's no leaks and all that stuff you know because once you get it going it's a, it's a bad time to have to fix a leak well, uh, what happened was earlier on, before I even got started, I removed this top sight glass. I just unscrewed it off. I was like, oh, that's really neat, and I screwed it back on. Um, but when I screwed it back on, I had it kind of cocked. So once this plate loaded, it started leaking. So I was like, oh my goodness. I shut everything off real quick, and then I fixed that, which thank goodness it was an easy fix, and then I turned it back on, so everything is okay. Uh, brings up a question. George, can I start my run and then something comes up? Can I stop it and restart it later on? Well, you certainly can, uh, but remember that all depends on where you are in the run. If you're really, really close to the end of the run, sort of like the question is, you know, why would you at that point? I mean, just, you know, kind of call it quits and keep what you got and move on. Uh, but if you have just started your run, oh yeah, it's perfectly okay to just turn it off. Now, things to consider. Um, the temperature that it's setting there at, it's going to continue to vaporize at least for a little while. So are you going to lose a little bit? Yeah, potentially you're going to lose a little bit, but I mean, really, it's not that much at that point for you to really be concerned about. So yeah, perfectly okay for you to turn it off and then come back tomorrow and turn it back on and try to finish the run. Um, keep in mind though, just keep this in mind that, uh, that when you turn it back on and start to complete that run, uh, your results are not going to be duplicate of the results you had when you first started it. You know, that's just, I mean, that's, that just, that's common sense. So um, I think we're just about at the point to where we've, yeah, we've got this thing loaded. Um, and what I've been allowing this to do when we call loading the column is we've got a full reflux. So very, very little, if any, if any at all of the vapors have passed through down into the condenser. Uh, and I know that because there's nothing in my Parrot and it's been running here for about a good eight minutes or so. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn back the, uh, the water flow in my deflagmator. Keep this in mind, what is happening right now? Let's describe that, okay? I've got this heated to a point to where the ethanol and some water with it is starting to vaporize and it's rising up this column. And as it rises up this column, it gets to the very top where it goes through, we call it a deflagmator, but it's, it's really, it's a condenser. 
and we've got that thing running at full bore, 100 percent. So we're actually condensing everything and we're allowing it to drop back down as a liquid. And as it drops back down as a liquid, it's landing on these individual plates and it's re-vaporizing and rising again. That is the description of reflux. Okay, reflux. It's vaporizing, condensing, dropping, revaporizing, and the most volatile substances being the ethanol, and the water drops out, is rising again. And this continues to happen, and each time it happens, it becomes more and more pure. And it also becomes more and more pure on each one of these plates. So at some point, once we're loaded, uh, this would just sit here and run like this for quite a while. Uh, at some point, we just turn down the water flow and we adjust that from 100% down to a percentage that allows vapor to pass through our condenser. And we'll know when that's happening when we, our head temperature changes. Okay, Our head temperature should start to climb slightly. And we won't let that climb to like 175-ish, somewhere in that neighborhood. And each one of your stills will be a little bit different. So let me slow this water flow down like one quarter turn. And I'll just be patient. And this may take a quarter turn down, you know, an eighth of a turn and then another half a turn. But it'll be this balancing routine that I'll go through. Uh, as I slow down this reflux, and when that happens and I finally get it balanced, we'll come back and show that to you too. I wanted to show you this at this point because we are now, uh, that was 40, we're an hour and five minutes, 65 minutes, and we're starting to produce our four shots. Uh, my head temperature is slightly over 170, which is what we're looking for. Uh, here's what I had to do. I had to get the water flow adjusted just precisely, and, but I had to balance that with enough energy going into the still to keep the bubble plates active. So right now, uh, I've got, I still got both elements. I could actually shut one off and run the other one full bore, but I've got them both at like 11.5 to 12. So it's like running one 5,500 watt element. Now, I'll be able to slow that down shortly. Uh, once we get this thing to balance, but I'm pumping out 195 proof. Uh, I know I got to get a close-up because you're not going to believe this. There's my 200 proof mark. So I'm at like 195. And that's what this thing is starting to produce right now. And I've got everything balanced. Ooh, what do you think's going to happen next? Well, now we're at, uh, we've, I've collected like 250 milliliters plus whatever's in the parrot of uh, four shots. So gosh, I, all, all I get to do now is sit back and, and, and just let this run. Um, I can gab for several hours, but I'm not going to bore you. We shall return as soon as I get these four shots and the heads pulled. Um, and then I'll show you what those look like. Well, I've collected now, I'm um, at 750 milliliters. And that is uh, roughly, uh, I'm just shy of a quart, okay? Um, so I've already passed my four shots. Uh, my four shots was only, what was it, two, four, six, eight, eight ounces. Um, so uh, I'm really into drawing the heads. Now, what, here's, here's where it becomes sort of like touchy-feely, okay? This is just my technique. It's totally up to you. But remember I told you that the difference between heads and hearts, the only clear-cut separation besides smell, taste, feel, those things, uh, is going to be the difference in proof. And that's when you get that initial drop in proof, that change. Now, remember that this proof is what we call a lagging result. Now, a lagging result is a measurement of something that happened previously. You follow that? Yeah, I mean, it, it's already happened, but it takes a little bit of time because, of course, it's got to go all the way down through here and it's got to smear and mix in with what's in the parrot. So if this drops by a proof or two, to, I'd give it two proof points. When it drops to 93%, um, I will consider that the end of my heads. So I guess it really boils down and asks the question, well, George, what happens if it doesn't? What if it's so pure coming out that it stays at 95%? 
Well, you know, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. But remember I said earlier also that my heads are normally twice my four shots. So if I draw an additional 16 ounces, then that would be my heads. So, and again, the, a lot of people use heads to go back and reintroduce that for some of that flavor profile. But I'm going to wait to see if this drops just a little bit so I can consider that a cut. 